ES Audio. Hi, I'm Nick Clark. Just to let you know that one of the plays we're reviewing this episode has a rather explicit title, uh, which we'll be using right from the start. Right, on with the show. Hello, I'm Nick Curtis. I'm Nancy Durrant. And I'm Nick Clark, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Coming up on today's show, we'll be reviewing Lynn Nottage's Malima's Tale. That's on at the Kiln Theatre and stars Gabrielle Brooks. For our second review, and you'll have to excuse me, it's untitled Fuck Miss Saigon play at the Young Vic. <laughs> Telling it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's an award-winning play by Kimber Lee and is directed by Roy Alexander Wise. And we'll be joined by actress Antonia Thomas and writer Nina Siegel for their play Shooting Hedda Gabler. I think that there is often an expectation for actors, for performers, that they'll use themselves and use their lived experience and use their personal histories. And that can be abused. That's now on at the Rose Theatre. Hello, welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. This is our first podcast since Michael Gambon died, which was a terrible shame. And um, all the anecdotes about how, you know, sort of what a wicked sense of humour he was, what a prankster he was, what a great act he was. He was tremendous on stage. I saw him in Skylight, I saw him in Volpone, Mm. some really, really great performances. He is the only one of our leading actors who has spoken a line that I've written on stage. (laughs) Because I was was on an awards panel with um, Nicholas Wright, who was literally manager of the National Theatre and um, also a playwright and we were giving awards to pub theatres and we were considering one I won't mention the name of it but I said that guy who runs that pub theatre wouldn't know a decent play if it bit him on the arse (laughs) (laughs) and three weeks later Nick Wright said I've put that in in my play Cressida for Michael Gambon to speak. (laughs) (laughs) So who says critics never put anything back? It's an enduring sense of pride. (laughs) I was performed by Michael Gambon once. Brilliant. We miss him. Indeed. Quite a lot's come out this week, hasn't mm, it? Yeah. Stage debut awards. Yes. Oh, yes. Which lots of our faves. Lots of our lots faves. Lots of our there. faves, including a former interviewee on the podcast. Yep. Mm. Um, you and you, Nancy and Nick, interviewed Rob Madge. Yep. We did. They were wonderful. And yes. they won the Best Creative West End Debut Award. And yep. it was so lovely. Yes. So, indeed. so lovely. I'm personally delighted. I, I mean, I'm, I'm really carrying a torch for Elephant at the Bush as well by Anushka Lucas. It's her debut play. Yes. Uh, it's partly autobiographical. She's written it and performs it and plays the piano in it. I thought it was, was lovely. And that won the best, I think, new best writer, writer. Best yeah. writer award. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and then yeah. there's also Rose Ailing Ellis, who won, I think, the Best West End Debut Award for her performance in As You Like It. Yeah. Yeah. At Soho Place. And she was so delightful in oh. that as Celia yeah. and As You Like It. And I think it really, like, having a deaf actor, like, and they did, um, for anyone who didn't see it or hear our review of it, they did uh, Sir Titles. Sir Titles, yes. For, in fact, the whole play, not just her part, which was signed in, I think it's called something like Dramatic Vernacular. Ah. I might not be right about the first part of that, but it's a particular type of vernacular, and it's really incredibly expressive. Yes. And very funny. I think that's slightly shifted the dial a bit on kind of having deaf or hard of hearing actors in plays I think it was I think it was a really important thing actually. there was something they did with that as well which I saw they, they previously did when they had a deaf actress playing Celia at Shakespeare's Globe which is her levels of communication changed depending on who she was talking to ah. so when she was most intimate with someone she was just signing you know when she was yeah. se- semi intimate she would be doing a mixture of signing and speech and when she was with strangers she was she would speak to them um, yeah it's fascinating I think you know it, it does add a whole new dimension to the play yeah I once uh, interviewed someone who, who provided did the signing uh, for Papi Asiedu's uh, Hamlet mm. and actually it was an amazing thing because she would be on stage next to Papi Asiedu and she talked in really beautiful terms about it but talked about how she wasn't just signing she sort of saw herself as Hamlet's ghost just echoing what he was doing behind it was it really can enrich and deepen um, uh, you know a performance I think as hearing people who don't sign mm. we have absolutely no idea of the richness of sign language yeah. yes. like I think it, I mean it's a it's a different language and it has kind of complexities and subtleties that we simply have no idea about yeah, yeah it's completely fascinating mm. I loved it the lovely thing about the stage debut awards is they is they recognise all sorts of newcomers mm. you know in all sorts of levels yeah. and in all sorts of fields on the stage I like to think of them as a sort of appetiser before the evening standard theatre awards yeah. which are your main <laughs> meal of the year and which are coming <laughs> up in November absolutely anyway what else is going on 
More mean girls. Mean girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, so fetch. We, you've got to say, Nick, today is October happen, the 3rd, which is Mean Girl Day, apparently. Oh, is I did not it? know this. Yes, every year, October the 3rd is Mean Girl Day because it's referenced in the film. Right. Uh-huh. So they have clearly dropped this news very specifically. But uh-huh. it is big news that the Broadway, and it says in capital letters, smash hit musical <laughs> is coming to London from June next year. Mm. What fun. Yeah. 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 No, it will be great great. fun. I didn't know there was a Mean Girls Day. There's a light jacket day named after Miss Congeniality, isn't there? (laughs) Oh, fantastic. One of of the contestants is asked what her idea of a perfect date is, and she says June the 27th because it's not too hot, not too cold, all you need is a light jacket. (laughs) That's such a great line. June 27th is light jacket day. We can mark out our our year in rom-coms, can't we? We're going to have to wait till June 27th. I really want to read that piece. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say we'll wait till then for the announcement of the... Miss Congeniality musical, which presumably will come after that. I had a feeling. Surely yes. it must exist. I had Is a feeling not? there was one sort of in, in the oh, pipeline, but uh, but maybe well, I'm I wrong. Hope so. And there's another big transatlantic uh, announcement as well, oh, yeah. in that. Ulster American is going to be staged at the Riverside Studios with the big news that it's going to start Woody Harrelson. I know, slight curveball. Yeah. I don't know why, but I was just a bit like, well, eh? Yeah. He, his first role in 20 years on the London stage. Alongside Andy Serkis. I'm not yeah. sure what his last role was on the I London I was about stage. to ask you the question because I thought I you might remember. I can tell you, Night yeah. of the Iguana, 2005. Oh, oh yes, yeah. I did. Yes, I saw it. I know yes. that because it says it in the press release. <laughs> 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 I did not see it. But also, we should say, Louisa Harland makes up the third of the trio, and she is Orla in Derry Girls. Oh. So, I mean, that is a starry cast, if that ever is a, so yeah, that's And it's this weird thing that it's going on at, at Riverside Studios, yeah. which, in theory, has gone into administration, I, know, I think. what, are they um, just, like, breaking in every night? And <laughs> they seem to be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these, these fairly major productions seem yeah. to carry on. It shows you how much I know about what it means to be in administration. Going on there, I don't really know what I it means to be in administration. I thought it might close. Well, yeah, or I sort of thought it might be sold or something. Yeah. Or, um, I think, basically, they, they were burdened with debt because they rebuilt and they opened just before the pandemic yeah. Yeah. you know so I think you know that, that's that's what caused whatever technical legal thing they're in at the moment it doesn't seem to be harming their ability to attract A-list stars and oh, product no. does it and actually I'm really glad this play's coming back it's written by David Ireland who some listeners may know from Cypress Avenue which mm. caused uh, a lot of furore at the Royal Court some yeah. years ago David Ireland uh, wrote The Lovers which was recently aired on Sky which I actually really liked mm. um, and again that was a sort of rom-com, but with a twist, with a dark sort of edge to it. Is that the one with Johnny Flynn? It is, and Rasheen um, Gallagher. Yes, yes. It, absolutely. I thought it was brilliant, personally. I'm really fascinated to see this play, uh, not just because of the massive stars, but also because of the writer as well. It's Cy- dead good. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Cypress Avenue was great. Uh, Woody Harrelson must have some sort of connection to London because he did a live-action single-shot film in London, which I watched hmm. overnight, literally started it with a camera, Plotted it, yeah. followed him around the streets of London. There was a huge preamble to it where lots of famous people were interviewed saying, yeah, I think he's a genius. I think he's wonderful. I'd watch anything. Oh, Woody Harrelson. Jesus Christ. No, I thought you meant Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually extraordinary. It actually worked. I remember coming out, I was stumbling out of Clapham Picture House at like 3 a.m. in the morning thinking, I can't quite believe I've just watched that. So, really? So, yes. You to know. be fair, that well, special connection does seem to be once a decade. It does seem to be once a decade. Yeah, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, we'll see that. That, that, I mean, that, that'll, that'll be fascinating. And, and, you know, long live Riverside Studios. Absolutely. Right, let's get to our first review. It's Malima's Tale at the Kiln Theatre. You guys have seen this. I know it's about an elephant, which uh, my toddler refers to as a yeah you are. Uh, what can you tell me about it? Oh, wow. <laughs> None of the consonants allowed. No. <laughs> Don't know where that came from. He's two. It's a yeah you are. So. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I was super interested to see this because I so loved Lynn Nossage's 2015 play Sweat, yeah. um, uh, which was a sort of deeply researched drama set before the Trump presidency that looked at the decline of industry and the beginnings of the opioid crisis. Crisis, so kind of how that affected the the lives and the politics of the people living in the Rust Belt, America's Rust Belt. Uh, this is a sort of world-spanning exploration of the horribly corrupt world of ivory trading, starting yeah. in Kenya and ending up, I think, in Beijing. Yes, uh, um, via Vietnam. Yes, that's right. That's absolutely uh, and it kind right. of couldn't be more different, could it? It couldn't be more different. It is the most improbable thing that you'd see in a smallish theatre in North London that, you, that you're going to basically see a play with an elephant wandering through it. Yeah, uh, I mean it's haunted, isn't it? I, like, quite literally by the ghost of Malima, who yeah. is uh, known as the Mountain, um, a murdered bull elephant, yeah. butchered for his unusually long and symmetrical, beautiful tusks. He played by um, an actor called Ira Mandela Siobhan, and is quite epic. Ed- ed- 
episodic, but I think that's necessary, isn't it? Because it kind of lands wherever the illegal tusks travel once yeah. they've been removed from the elephant, um, which is many stops across the globe. Yes. Before they end up, like, I guess, butchered in another way, which is cut up into an exquisite carving. Yes. Uh, in someone's fancy penthouse. But I, I, I have to say, I was kind of spellbound, actually. Me too. Uh, we should say Ira Mandela Siobhan is an actor and a dancer. Um, yes. He has an extraordinary physicality. He's one of the Kens in the Barbie movie as Yay! well, I believe, or he's a dancer in the Barbie movie. Um, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't put on ears and a nose to play. No, thank elephant. God. It's not, thank uh, God. It's very much a sort of interpretative Oh, there's no puppets or anything? I assume there was some sort of war there's no style. Puppets. There's, there's a tiny bit a very clever shadow play where you get the sort of outline of an elephant's head at one point um, you know that's very cleverly done but as you say he basically plays the ghost of this elephant infecting and staining people with yeah. the whiteness of his ivory as he goes through the play so he is there as this sort of as we say ghostly presence haunting their their bodies and their dreams I think that's the idea that they're all going to be stained with guilt for what they've done to this yeah, exactly. last of the big old tuskers um, and the other thing is that, that I suppose that, that, um, that I think Dante does so cleverly is to explain how important these elephants are to to the tourist trade. Yeah, there. you know, and the fact that the loss of an elephant is not just one elephant amongst many that are sort of poached or killed. Uh, you know, this has a direct impact on the country's economy and on its tourist dollars. So uh, yeah, I mean, I thought I thought this was terrific. Yeah. Really nice ensemble cast in it, including Gabrielle Brooks, who we had on a few weeks ago talking about this show as well as her, her life in musicals and straight theatre and Grange Hill which she'd been in back course, in the day yeah. um, <laughs> lest we forget but is there singing does she get a chance to flex her vocal she does a bit a yeah, little bit she, she does has a bit. an it's extraordinary voice do, it's not like there are any numbers exactly right. it's not a musical but there are kind of moments of sort of almost not incidental music but, but atmospheric music which she is part of and um, but she's certainly the, I mean, the others sing as well, but she's certainly the kind of the leading voice yes. in a lot of that. I mean, she's brilliant in everything, isn't yeah. she? She's brilliant because they play lots of different roles and different genders as well. And she's kind of a joy in every one. I really think she ought to be more famous than she is. I think she should. I think well, let's that make TV it our mission. Producers, <laughs> yeah. Casting yes. directors, what are you doing? I you know, absolutely where agree. Where is Gabrielle Brooks on our screens? Yeah, there's a lot of it because, as you say, they play different um, uh, genders, ages, ethnicities all the way through this as well. And mm. uh, she's wonderful as a sort of swaggering African businessman isn't she and yeah oh, she's point, so she's funny as that guy really he's hilarious like, in that yeah. baggy suit I also particularly enjoyed Brandon Grace mm. who is a male or certainly certainly male presenting actor as a rich man's girlfriend spending his money on a new ivory centrepiece of their lavish home <laughs> like that was lovely at the end it was very funny but it never felt like a kind of female parody yeah it was done sort of for laughs but without feeling kind of yeah without being a bit off for a relatively short play 90 minutes this has a lot of detail in it as yeah. well doesn't it and a lot of sort of uh, incidental detail lovely stuff I mean I, I love the fact that the businessman Gabriel Brooks plays is um, dealing with a wedding you know yeah. a family wedding and constantly having to buy gifts for his soon to be exactly. in-laws sort of and mother-in-law is a demanding massage a refrigerator chair and things like that and a refrigerator like yes that. it's it's really funny I think Nottage is great at that sort yeah. of stuff I mean I think she really is terrific at weaving a, a very very dense very very fascinating narrative around whatever her, her, her attention and lights on no, and true. she's a phenomenally curious writer yeah. isn't she yeah exactly but you know even though it's like this is a litany of kind of corruption and casual cruelty and greed but I felt like I really learnt something but I didn't feel berated yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, it's directed by Miranda Cromwell, mm. who is a real rising star. I think she was the, the co-director of the wonderful Death of a Salesman mm. done with Wendell Pierce uh, and Sharon D. Clark a few yeah. years back. Yeah, that um, was fantastic. I think she does a terrific job here. On it. It's very, very simply staged, but very effectively staged. I tell you what, though, I, I mean, we, you may disagree, but I don't love the design. No, I, mean, I wasn't not, totally spinning yeah, it. It's no. not an easy project. Like There are a few early scenes of like extreme brutality. Uh, but I do think that could have been... I mean, it's stylized enough as it is. I think that could have been taken care of quite easily within the direction. And to be honest, I sort of think that endlessly swishing muslin curtains have more than a whiff of the school play about them, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. But otherwise, I think as a production, it works really, really well. I, just, yeah. I don't know. I think the sort of endless swishing backwards and forth, it, it, you know, they just... Curtains never look good unless they cost the earth. Yes. And so I think that is... like That's always a bit of an issue. If you can avoid curtains, then... 
That's a good thing. Top tip, theatre designers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, Nottage, I think we should mention, is a previous winner of the Evening Standard Award. She is still, I think, the only black woman and certainly the only, um, probably the only woman, I think, to have won the Pulitzer Prize twice. Yeah. Sweat, incidentally, was based on her visit to, uh, I think, her experience of the miners' strike over yeah. here, weirdly. So, I mean, she just does have this amazing ability to, to sort of turn mm. what you would think would be unpromising subject matter into utterly fascinating stuff. And she talked to so many people as well. She went to, to the place you know where this is set or yeah. is a place like it and kind of talk to so she does she really 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 does her research and it really shows but she does it with such a light touch i think yeah and nottage fans there's clyde's is coming up as yeah. well and which then, is a sort of which is a sort of sequel yes. to sweat actually yeah. yeah and then next year there's perhaps more controversially um the mj musical yes. she's written a book for that as well yeah Oh, and the uh, Malima's Tale is on until October 21st. You can hear our interview with Gabrielle Brooks, which talks about Malima's Tale and everything else in the show notes for this podcast. Time for a quick break. Coming up, we'll be joined by Antonia Thomas and writer Nina Siegel for their play Shooting Head of Gabler at the Rose Theatre. Hello, I'm Joseph Fiennes, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Joining us down the line, right before the press night, are Nina Siegel and Antonia Thomas, the writer and star of Shooting Hedda Gabler at the Rose Theatre. Nina, starting off, could you give us a brief overview of the play? Yeah, so it's an adaptation of Henry Ibsen's Hedda Gabler. It's set in contemporary times. And it's set on a movie adaptation, a Norwegian movie adaptation of Hedda Gabler. So it follows a company of actors and a director who are making a new version of Hedda Gabler themselves. Was there ever a time when you thought you may do a version of the original Hedda Gabler? I did originally do a draft without the the meta frame on it. But even in those very early drafts, there were characters that were filmmakers. There was this idea of horror movies. There was this this instinct that in some way the lens of cinema would be useful and also that potentially some of the genre of slight kind of horror, that feel of the walls closing in on somebody, might be useful. And Antonia, you you play Hedda. Have you ever studied the play at drama school or even performed it before? Have you wanted to play Hedda? Yeah, you know, I've never properly studied it. I read it at drama school and... You know, I mean, I guess Hedda's one of those roles, they sort of describe it as the female Hamlet or something. It's, you know, it's a seminal role for a woman. So it's not one that I had, like, thought that is the role I want to play, but it's certainly one that I thought at some point, if that comes along, that would be an exciting challenge, you know. So when Nina's script came to you, what did you think of playing this version of Hedda? How did you approach the role? It sort of felt like the most wonderful version of something that you could be approached with because it's a new, fresh take on something that people feel like they know really, really well in a completely different arena, a completely different person who's actually not Hedda, but is trying to be. And so there are just so many more amazing layers to play within that, as well as trying to be Hedda Gabler. <laughs> you know, it's it's just some, an amazing challenge. It really has been um, a challenge. And Jeff James, our director, has been really... Uh, wonderful at kind of shepherding us, me and all of the actors kind of through it. The biggest challenge has been at any one moment figuring out whether Hedda, whether she feels when she's sort of feeling like herself and when she's feeling like she's sort of becoming Hedda, um, you know, and kind of like and where she is within that. And then when she's sort of pulled out of it because of what's happening around her, what, how she's being manipulated and you know, that was really, um, that really has been and is and is still something that we're kind of finding every time you discover something kind of new, which is really exciting. But um, yeah, I, I think it was just sort of like absolutely mining the text, going through it again and again and again and figuring out those kind of shifts and changes and moments. And then, you know, studying people that I think as a an actress she could be like and then bringing it to the rehearsal room and just sort of playing basically. Nina, I read part of doing this was inspired by conversations brought forward by uh, the Me Too movement. Can you just tell us a little bit how the Me Too movement inspired you and and how did it find its way into the play? I think that looking at the original and thinking about adapting it, I was really interested in the idea of power and how that manifests in the original. And I think that in the theatre industry, in the film industry, anywhere that people are 
acting and engaging in fictions and having to inhabit fictions. Uh, I do think for whatever reason, that's very ripe for abuse. You have a very hierarchical system. I mean, Christian, who plays Henrik, said this amazing thing early on. He's from Norway. And he said in Norway, it's very, very flat, very non-hierarchical, except for the military and the theatre, which just felt really key in a way to go like, why do we as an industry that, you know, I hope thinks of ourselves as quite progressive and quite liberal and quite thoughtful and open, still have these very hierarchical structures within a rehearsal room that, like I say, are, are often quite ripe for abuse. And so bringing together that lens of the film set, it made sense to think about power in particularly this kind of director actor relationship. The Me Too movement still feels like an issue. Yeah, I think that there is often an expectation for actors, for performers, that they'll use themselves and use their lived experience and use their personal histories. And that can be abused, but it's very hard to... I think it might be harder to draw the line of what's okay and what's not okay. If you work in a bank and your boss says, tell me about the first time you had sex, you're not going to. (laughs) It's very clear that's not appropriate. If you're in a rehearsal room, I think it's harder to be clear and say that's not necessary for my work. Antonia, did that resonate with you as well? Absolutely. I think off the back of what Nina just said, I think as well, you want to be game within any kind of new creative environment. It's also especially really exciting when you're working with a new director or creative and they've got a different way of working. And I mean, in most jobs, there's a sense of wanting to prove yourself, (laughs) wanting to prove to that director, to the person that's sort of chosen you and picked you to the role that you are the role, you can be the role and that you're willing to push some boundaries in order to get there. Yeah, the lines are so blurry because those boundaries can be sort of any kinds of boundaries, but then suddenly you're in territory that feels really uncomfortable. And yeah, you know, that's, I think that can happen really, really easily. And sometimes without even realising as the person who's pushed the boundary that you've pushed a boundary that's weird, you know, and then you're suddenly like, oh, oh, afterwards. So, I mean, I think the way Nina's written the script is just so brilliant because she's really kind of like, you know, it kind of really veers off into that realm. And I can see how it so easily can. I've been lucky enough that for the most part, I felt pretty safe within a creative environment. But I think it's very, very easily done, yeah. Have you ever come across a director like Henrik in the play? (laughs) Luckily not, no. <laughs> Luckily not. But, but, but yeah, Jeff James, no. But within our um, within our rehearsal room and the stories, you know, some of our, my, my fellow castmates have worked with some tricky sounding people, not quite like Henrik, but you know, not sort of far off. And it's scary to hear that they're out there too, you know. It feels like the play lifts a curtain on the process itself. A lot of people might not realise the dynamics behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think of filming a film set and, it, you know, it's just a little microcosm in itself, all the weird like happenings and goings on and the way that I always forget now, having worked in film and TV quite a lot, that it sort of comes to me second nature in, in regards to knowing the environment. But it's quite weird, the different kind of, I don't know, just the hierarchical system that that Nina talks about, you know, like the different ways that people kind of interact with each other. Or oh, I have, I have my, my trailer and you have your trailer and don't come into mine. And this is, oh, I'm not sharing. And all of these like weird little things that kind of like compound and compound that very much within a film set are supposed to be the way that they are. And so when these things sort of start to blur and break down and yeah, kind of, creates a very interesting sort of tension. Absolutely. And, and what I found really interesting is that the set has an intimacy coordinator and an on-set therapist, uh, uh, possibly the same character. I think every show where there is intimacy work, there should be an intimacy director. I think that we're seeing more and more that shows with difficult content, therapist or support is being attached for the company. I think it all works, but I think it is only as powerful as the power that it's given. I think it has to come from the top. The director has to be on board with that. And obviously it's fiction in this show, but it's just, it's so easy if the person in charge is not willing to empower the people whose responsibility it is to keep everybody safe, then it's very difficult to keep everybody safe. Within this show where we're trying to stage a very unsafe work environment, we're trying to stage very unsafe interactions. We're working with weapons. We're 
working with intimacy. I hope we've done a good job of it, but it's, it's a real process to go, how do you make something seem unsafe, but absolutely be safe for the people participating in it? And my last question, Antonia, has this made you more or less likely to play Hedda in a straight production of the play in the future? Oh, I don't know. I feel like this is just so much more exciting. <laughs> no, I mean, I, oh, you know, who who knows down the line, but I feel like it just feels like the most exciting thing. Like I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked for a more exciting creative challenge than a sort of modern day retelling of such a classic, you know, and there are just so many more exciting layers that I feel like I get to play. Of course, I would never turn down the opportunity to play Hedda, but I think it might be quite weird, actually, after having done this version of it. So who knows? <laughs> I'm really looking forward to seeing the play. Nina Siegel and Antonia Thomas, thank you so much for joining us on the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. Thank, thank you. you. Let's go to the ads. In the meantime, why not give this podcast a follow? In part three, we'll be reviewing Untitled Fuck Miss Saigon Play. We'll see you back here in just a sec. Hi, I'm Marisha Wallace, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Welcome back. Well, before we go into our next review of Untitled Fuck Miss Saigon Play, uh, we just wanted to recap on a couple of things we've all caught up on this week, didn't we? Yeah. Nancy, you, you know in what? particular. Yeah. I went to see Wicked. Yay! <laughs> I went to see I have seen it before, but I took my uh, goddaughter, Vivian, the great and powerful, <laughs> and I kind of forgotten what a great show it is. It was the 17th birthday gala performance and green balloons everywhere, which is great, <laughs> and she absolutely loved it. I was so happy. It's got a stonking pair of female central roles. But you know what really struck me about it? was the depiction of fake news from way before that was a thing. Because like when Elphaba stands up for the animals against the ruling regime, she's the victim of a fake news campaign, which is what paints her as the Wicked Witch of the West and tells lies about what she's done and kind of massages the truth. And then you see the proliferation of it and the way it takes on a life of its own. It's terrifyingly prescient. Mm. I was like, <laughs> what? I'd completely forgotten that bit. I mentioned that to Vivian. She was like, huh. <laughs> so, okay. There's just no orange witches with sort of straw hair. So yeah, no, <laughs> that would no, have been really impressive, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was really good. I really enjoyed it. It's good. It's, I mean, it's great when those long runners are still knocking out the park, yeah. you know, because the shows can get tired, can't yeah. they? And Nick, you, uh, you went to see Woodhill. I did. It was given five stars by our reviewer up in Edinburgh. So I was really keen to see it. I mm. went to the Shoreditch Town Hall last week. We just missed recording on the, on the podcast. It's a really extraordinary bit of theatre. Right. Uh, to describe it, it's basically dance but with real testimonies spoken by actors mm. and then performers perform to that and what it is essentially is lung theater this great campaigning theater company have spent years finding out about the justice system but specifically talking about or, or looking at woodhill prison in milton Keynes, mm. where an extraordinary amount of young men have taken their own lives Right. And they zero in on three stories, clearly three family members who have wanted to talk about this. And there's, like say, real testimony, real, you know, they're real words spoken by actors, but it's spoken over a tannoy. Mm. So there's three men. Every time it focuses on one of the men, their corresponding family member, one of the dancers, basically is choreographed in time with that. And it's the most extraordinary thing. Very, very hard watch. Very harrowing watch. I mean, some of it even reminded me of Cleansed. It's in this sort of warehouse. It's lighting, harsh lighting over mm -hmm. the top. And just their bodies would sort of start, you know, moving in, in really odd, punctured ways. It was, it was really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. And the, the testimony is really, really hard to listen to because these are all avoidable deaths. It really sh uses these stories to then shine a light on how the justice system is essentially completely broken. Totally mm. failing people. Uh, totally failing people, how these people who are in for very minor crimes have died. Mm. It's extraordinarily moving and just you can't leave theatre like that without having your brain just slightly... <laughs> slightly yeah, changed yeah, your equilibrium shift. Yeah, yeah and as with other things with, with with lung they are pushing it further they've got campaigns to take to the justice secretary i think the signature campaigns and all sorts of things and with these family members still involved uh just to try and get justice it gives you a good indication of kind of one of the things that theater can do doesn't it mm. just, absolutely you know, it can, it's not just a thing 
to watch for entertainment. It's yeah. something oh, that, that yeah. really, I mean, it doesn't not, sound at all entertaining. You're, you're, you're not <laughs> going not out on the word. That. <laughs> no, but it is what theatre does at the other end and just yeah. sort of rearrange your atoms a little bit. Well, yeah, at the other end, I caught up on Frank and Percy, the Ian McKellen and Roger Allen show Aww. that you guys interviewed on the podcast. You can find those interviews in the in the show notes. Um, it was reviewed by Tim Bano for us in, in Windsor, then moved very quickly into town. It's, always, it's just wonderful seeing the two of them just going, you know, mm. sparking off each other. Yeah. It's another one of McKellen's great bromances, mm. you know, the, the, that he has with Roger Allen, and they're tremendously at ease together on the stage. Great. Well, shall we get into our review now of Untitled Fuck Miss Saigon play at the Young Vic? Let's do it. First of all, I think this play probably has the award for the best title of the year. I think it's all, <laughs> it's all downhill from the title, to be honest. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but you tell us what, what, what it's about. So this play is 100 minutes straight through, but it's kind of split into two. The first half is basically reenacting perhaps the biggest shows by Western writers in the, sort of in the Western canon that focus on Southeast Asian characters. It sort of highlights the racist tropes and the ridiculous prejudices and, and skewers them with sort of fairly cutting, fairly furious uh, in, in, in furious terms. So it sort of starts with Madama Butterfly. It goes to South Pacific, MASH, the world of Susie Wong and, of course, Miss Saigon. Yeah. All the women are called Kim, the protagonists, um, even though as the play points out that Kim is a Korean surname. Yep. So, uh, you know, no one's bothered to check. Uh, and, no, and no matter where they're actually from, because this, of course, covers all manner of different countries, people from Japan, China, Polynesia. I mean, it's an extraordinary range, Vietnam. Yeah. And yet all of the characters basically are the same tropes, the same character and the same things happen to them. They sort of, they slightly um, alter and simplify the, the plots of the various yep. things. So they all yep. fit the Madame Butterfly stereotype. Yep. And they, Kim is approached by a hunky westerner mm. who speaks a series of just garbled random foreign words yeah. like sushi tatami yeah 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 macrame sort and of kim's things. always a, either a virginal peasant or a sex worker essentially yeah where. basically and she's always got a flower in her hair yeah. and tumbling sable curls and she always yeah. sort of looks up at him with her little eyes and, mm-hmm. um, and there's always some sort of pimp character usually yeah. her mother sometimes yeah. her fiance who's sort of thrusting her towards the western so she can get away from her horrible life in asia yeah uh, but of course she isn't saved from her horrible life she's impregnated abandoned uh, then her, her sort of supposed the, lover comes back with his, comes back. with his white yes, wife every time. and whisks away her child. Now, this doesn't happen in all, the, all these plays, but the point and is that, that it does, in fact, happen well, in two of them. Yeah, but the central <laughs> and the, she ends yes. up killing herself, which happens in most of them. Oh, exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. But the, but the central idea is that it, that it, it mines the same basic tropes, yep. as you said, yes. And then that then flips in the second half of this one. <laughs> you know, it, it is straight through, but it's sort of, it's, it's very distinct half. Uh, and leaps to 2023, where it's basically there's a sort of multicultural uh, dinner party. It's an engagement party. Kim is there, but she's beginning to sort of feel very uncomfortable with the surroundings. She she th- feels something's wrong, and she's not quite sure what it is. She's she's sort of out of place. She's in this Lululemon running gear, and everyone else is sort of v- very nicely put together. And then, without realizing, she starts or she starts to realize that she's internalized all of these other Kims, all of these storylines. And how do you move forward when? Mm the society that you're in has internalized those two and those are the stories that are told about you and your heritage essentially and so she basically attempts to escape the suggestion being even in 2023 even though these plays are not being written like this in fact these characters are just still shackled by these same tropes, these same sort of stereotypes. So yeah, I mean, I, you can you can absolutely see why playwright Kimberley felt absolutely livid, livid, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, excoriatingly <laughs> furious about this. But the question for me was how effective that is as a as a piece of of stage work, entertainment, sure. or even stimulation. I personally felt I was being sort of hammered over the head throughout this. It's Each not scenor- subtle. It's not subtle. Each scenario is acted out with the same level of sort of like cartoony panto style freneticism there's almost you know a sort of wily coyote style sort of um, yeah. exaggeration to it it's done extremely well kim is played by may mac she's superb fantastic may Mac's amazing. Oh. she's really yeah. of my neighbor totoro yes yeah, she was the smaller of the two girls wasn't yes she? Well, that's when right. i say smaller i mean like she was the younger she played the, the younger yes. girl mm. Yeah, she was fantastic. I actually think all of them were great. I think all of them are great. Um, I think Roy Alexander White's direction is is immaculate. My issue is purely with the play. It's sort of difficult, isn't it? Because it is trying to make a very very strong point, so that you can leave the theatre and absolutely know, you know, you know yeah. um, that 
that she has furiously wanting to furiously dismantle all of these tropes. And, you know, because this is not something that I, you know, as a white bloke, have particularly thought about. And so it is Same. Yeah. It is something that has kind of needed to be hammered over your head, you know, with look at the similarities, look at the line drawn all the way from the early 1900s, or pretty much all the way to now, mm. until quite recently. Many people won't have noticed, but actually, and this is why I'm going to repeat and repeat and repeat. Now, my problem with the repetition, because often comedy can be found in repetition. Yeah. But I think, as you said in, in your review, Nick, which I agree with, in this case, it was more the law of diminishing returns, in fact. Right. Yeah. So I, I was it's hoping a fine to... fine and difficult line it, It's train, really, it? really yeah. fine, because I think it was the right track. But what I was hoping for, that it would become more nuanced and funnier the more the scenes were sort of repeated, you know, as Madame Butterfly became South Pacific, became Miss Saigon. Mm. And they do do some of it really well, and people were laughing. But at the same time, I found the repetition occasionally just left me cold. Do you feel yeah. like it just needs like one more edit? Is that is it that sort of situation? I or? mean there's there's a certain um I think sense that it you, know, you, you will watch call this. It a pass. Yes, yeah. and you will yeah. call it, and call you it will an pay edit that's me cutting. <laughs> In the transition between the sort of first parts where they're where they're lampooning the, the previous representations and the second bit set on the Lower East Side uh, the woman playing Kim's mother on the in the East Side scenes has this sort of fifteen minute speech where she talks about how oversensitive the young are today, and actually she loved the world of Susie Wong, and if she needed representation, all she had to do was look to her left or to her right because she had five family members living with her in the mm. same. It's just the most bizarre sort of finger waggy provocation in the face of the audience, um, mm. and comes as the play sort of edges into its second hour, and, you, it, and as, as it gets towards the end, you are watching Kim desperately trying to escape and thinking, I, I know how you feel. <laughs> I actually, do you know what? I actually became much more engaged in the second half ah, okay. because I found the writing much more nuanced, much more interesting because it, it isn't that lampooning of tropes that we've all seen before. This was trying to grapple with something in 2023 that I found much more interesting. So um, when Kim has her monologue, I thought that was great and it really deals with yeah. how someone tries to deal with these issues, someone who is Southeast Asian in 2023. I thought it was superb. And the mother speech I thought was beautifully written actually and mm. beautifully performed Yeah, it is an odd provocation but in a way it is a sort of generational thing I think the play is saying that you know this is what the generation before would say to the younger generation who want more and who want different and want change yeah. so it sort of shows you that you haven't necessarily got the support Abs- when, you go, when you look above yes, yeah. that you might, and, you, and, and you haven't got the support from left to right because those are your, your peers who might not be and you not have the same heritage and so you don't know you're sort of trapped maybe mm. this is a co-production with the Royal Exchange uh, Factory International for the Manchester International Festival and Headlong as well as the Young Vic and I can see absolutely why the Young Vic wanted it mm. and why it makes sense for them because it does have one of the most diverse and youngest audiences in town and they you know the the crowd on press night seemed to be enjoying it you know I saw I, it last night and it was a really young crowd and they were sort of dancing beforehand it clearly oh, engaged them happens. and for the most part in, engaged me and uh, again so it's not subtle but it no. is a very bold and furious and brave piece of theater making i think you know it it's very funny in parts i just wished it, uh, i so i read one review that said uh, in in different parts it's a lot easier to admire than to love and yeah. i sort of understand yeah. that yes. as well mm. but i think technically there's a lot of very nice writing in there but yeah uh, in terms of it all hanging together as one sort of piece i think it, 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 it really you, it, it sort of splits into different bits where you are engaged in, or, or less engaged, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's it for this week's episode of the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Check out all our other episodes below, which include interviews with Joseph Fiennes, Gabriel Brooks, Sir Ian McKellen and Roger Allen, and many, many more. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss us. Thanks to our producer, Rachel Abbott, and we'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>